Uh, work. Welcome to the Foreign Affairs uh, Institute series on uh, Kurdistan. Thank you for your um, attendance uh, here today. I am particularly pleased um, to present good colleagues that look at regional interactions. Today our focal point is the assessment of non-Arab foreign policies towards the Kurdistan region of uh, Iraq. And with us today, um, we have Dr. Bayar Mustafa Sevdin, who is the Dean of the School of Social Sciences at the University of Kurdistan, Hawiler. Dr. Bayar will be reflecting on Turkey's foreign policy vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Kurdistan region of uh, Iraq. Our second speaker, uh, Cenk Sagnik, a Chief Analyst of Tamsi Solutions, uh, a multinational geopolitical consultancy firm based in the US, Israel and the UAE. Um, uh, but um, before that, he was also um, a, um, a program leader at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies in um, Israel. But um, before we start, I think it's good if we um, just go through a few housekeeping notes. Um, each speaker presents for 15 minutes and the event is going to be an hour and 15 minutes long. Whereas at the very end, we will have the opportunity for Q&As and you can ask uh, and you can send your um, uh, questions to the following email info info at fainst.eu. And uh, I think we can start with uh, Dr. Bayar. So Dr. Bayar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for uh, having me and good afternoon, dear colleagues. Well, uh, when it comes to Turkey and Kurdistan's relation, really 2007 is a remarkable point in the, in, in the relations, 2007, 2008. And that really remarked a very radical change uh, in, in the Turkish foreign policy towards the Kurds. Well, the change basically, uh, and that, that change wasn't just related to that to Kurdistan, but it was a, a result of the victory of AKP in the elections from 2001. It was the first time in the history of Turkey that a party won the vast majority of the votes, which was established out of the Kemalist, let's say, ideology. So AKP wasn't just an Islamic party, it was a coalition consist of, yes, Islamic leadership, but also people who were ever, all people who were really affected badly from the Kemalist ideology. It was a coalition consist, as I said, of Kurds, people like other minorities, uh, academicians, uh, thinkers, uh, free journalists, this, and of course, uh, two very important Kurdish figures were participating in, in establishing that party. So that coalition and plus the Gulen, Gulen movement, plus the Gulen movement. So that was, that was the beginning of, of, of the Turkish, let's say, uh, redefinition of, the, of, of, of Kurds in general. So the 2008 remark, the first, let's say, uh, official, uh, change in the in the relations and from 2008 until 2010 uh, a lot of discussion happened and Turkey after 2010 as a part of a bigger initiative towards the Middle East and Kurds were uh, allocated as as an element of new Turkish foreign policy new definition rediscovering of the Middle East uh, by 2010. And as you know, it was part also of uh, uh, Dawood Oglo's project, which was very, very well sailed to Erdogan and other AKP leaders, even Americans. So having a new policy towards KRG, it wasn't uh, it, it won't be very precise if you say it was just a, 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 towards, it, it was towards all the Kurds. It was one package. Still, uh, the Turkish view over the Kurds was there, you know, dynamic that, that recognized or def, uh, 
uh, they, they do, do not differentiate between the dynamics of Kurdish politics inside Turkey and outside of Turkey. That's why after 2010, we had also that opening democracy what was really also conducted uh, in Turkey with, uh, with Abdullah Ujalan, with uh, you know, Kurdish leadership, with PKK as well. So the, 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 but, but the real, real honeymoon uh, in, in the relations was in Erbil. I mean, Erdogan visited Erbil and uh, he, he, he participated in, in the ceremonies of opening the first airport, new airport actually, the second uh, airport in Kurdistan. In 2010, Turkish and Kurdish flags were, were, were flying on the streets. So that was really, uh, no one can deny that. Uh, it was a very, very radical shift in the relations between Turkey or the Turkish foreign policy towards Kurdistan in particular, but generally the initiative was for the all Kurds. So that honeymoon lasted almost for five or four years. The real challenge to the relations happened when ISIS attacked Sinjar. KRG expected Turkey, because Turkey really, no one can deny that Turkey really helped KRG to manage, administrate, and manage the conflict with Maliki. K Turkey uh, helped KRG to construct that uh, oil pipeline. Uh, you know, they really managed their relations in, in Erbil also very well. There was an, a bit of exaggeration, but until 2013, the relations were really progressing very well. Uh, in 2000, the, the challenge came in 2014 when ISIS uh, attacked Erbil and there was almost no reaction from Turkey. Again, in 2000, in, in Kobani as well. However, in Kobani, because of the pressure of uh, the United States and public opinion in Turkey and still the peace process with Ojalan, with PKK was ongoing there and of course, this constitutional change elections, the president of Turkey was in need of uh, the support of HDP and Kurds also outside of even President Barzani was called to Diyarbakir, you know, in, on uh, March 2015. So relations were really still there at some standards and they were, uh, but, but, the, the, the challenge were really serious. The challenge were really serious. The challenge, as I said, Kobani, Sinjar, really, these two points really remarked also uh, uh, a new policy was, was ref uh, I mean, uh, formed, was, was about to form in Turkey with, with the change of, of the uh, system there from parliamentary to presidency. Well, uh, the, the other update, let's say, or what fostered really the new dynamics and dimensions of the Turkish foreign policy towards Turkey came with, with, with the John or July's uh, coup in Turkey, the failure coup. So that really revealed a lot of things and fostered uh, let's say, or at least uh, uh, polish the relations and put the relations uh, to some realistic standards. So Turkey basically, uh, they were not in a position still to, uh, let's say, withdraw from their relations with KRG because they were really, KRG already gave a lot uh, to Turkey from their relations with, from, uh, with Ankara, but still, uh, uh, of course, Turkey also benefited a lot, but, but, but KRG was the, was, was the most more advantaged part, partner in, in, in that relationship. In 2016, uh, and, and of course the elections, the Turkish elections in the end of 2016, mid of 2015, when HDP rejected the coalition with Erdogan, then the, 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 the distrust increased also in, uh, in the, after the coup. 
well, Erdogan had to really bargain more and search for more, uh, uh, let's say, partners. In 2013, he lost Golan movement. In 2015, he lost HDP and Ujalan support. In 2016, he was almost uh, losing all, let's say, uh, uh, thinker, uh, activists, the brains, you know, the, the famous journalist is uh, in Turkey. So he was almost alone. In order, uh, alone, in order to survive and move on, he really needed uh, a good local or national partner. So he had to make a deal with uh, MHP. And as you know, in H MHP, they had one condition and the condition was just to go back to the old Kemalist uh, policy and, and, and really uh, be harsh at, at, at the Kurds inside and outside of uh, Turkey. No one can deny the uh, Erdogan and AKP's contribution in, in, in really developing the Turkish foreign policy positively towards Kurds and Kurdistan. But also, as I said, uh, things inside Turkey were getting tougher for him. And in 2017, we, we managed to, I mean, unfortunately, uh, the referendum was, was a, a very good excuse in the hands of Erdogan and, and Turkey, Turkish policymakers, his new partner to, uh, let's say, withdraw or at least, uh, you know, uh, uh, have another approach towards Kurds inside Turkey, but also outside of Kurdistan. Uh, so after the referendum, honestly, me personally, I, I expected a very, very strong reaction from, from Turkey against KRG. I expected a, a, a big operation against Erbil, but still uh, the reaction was not that, that strong, which was also revealed, I don't know, maybe, uh, Erdogan was still, uh, you know, somehow hoping, uh, you know, to, to, or at least his view over Kurdistan was still uh, uh, charming, and he, 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 his reading to the map of Iraq was, was still more realistic, and how KRG is important for Turkey to balance the power in Baghdad. So the reaction was not that much strong. The gate remained open. The president or prime minister of Kurdistan with his deputy, they were able still, uh, the air uh, space was, was, was uh, closed by Baghdad, not by Turkey, but Kuba, Talabani, and uh, the current president of KRG, Nechaban Barzani, was were able to travel via Turkey to France. Well, at some point, uh, the relations were changed. The policy was changed. The Turkish policy was became more into marginalizing KRG, shrinking the boundaries of KRG, and limiting KRG's, uh, uh, let's say, power in Baghdad. But as I said, still, it wasn't uh, that much harsh and extreme as we expected. Uh, still, KRG. Uh, kept a good relations with Turkey, still KRG was able uh, to, to maintain uh, the, the economical and also the, the oil flooding via Turkey. Uh, however, Abadi and other people, he did not even deny that. He, he, the, how, the way that he bargained with Turkey just to block the, the OKRG's oil from exportation to, to Europe. So uh, what I can say in, 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 in conclusion, now I think the current foreign policy towards, towards Kurdistan is really realistic. Uh, and, and I don't think KRG leadership is surging or expecting something more than this because 
uh, the, even KRG, they have redefined their priorities and the, the, the new cabinet of KRG uh, at the very beginning of, of uh, its establishment, they said that, well, we have an approach, we have a new vision of, of our role in, inside Iraq and in, 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 in out, so out of Iraq. And we think that strong investment in Baghdad will really promote both Baghdad and Erbil. And still, they also uh, confirm their policy towards neighbors, both Turkey and Iran. And uh, they, the message was, well, uh, KRG will still do its, its strongest uh, best to keep the security of the borders with both countries and KRG will not be a threat to any of the neighboring countries, both Turkey uh, and uh, Iran. And I think the United States of America and their status or, uh, in, inside Iraq, especially after this withdrawal from uh, 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 Afghanistan and their plan to withdraw from Iraq will tell us a lot about the future relations between Turkey and KRG. Uh, and personally, I think the change has been met and uh, I, I, I cannot guarantee that the, the person who will replace Erdogan will have a better policy towards the Kurdistan region, but I can uh, assure you that uh, the change has been made and uh, both countries, let's say, both directions, they have managed to come over to very, very serious challenges, especially the referendum. I don't thank know you if very I... much. Thank you. Yeah, we will have uh, the chance to come back. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, just like how Bayar explained the relations between Turkey and, and the Kurdistan region of Iraq with references to milestones in these, uh, in these bilateral relations, I will also focus on four milestones in uh, relations between Israel and the Kurds in general. Um, but I will also try to avoid the parts that are already known and focus on the um, on the features of this of this relationship, with a focus on on Iraqi Kurdistan. So we have basically four milestones in relations of uh, between Israel and the Kurdistan region. The first one, or the latest, is 2017, as Dr. Bayar also mentioned, uh, is when the Kurdistan region of Iraq held the independence referendum. Uh, including the areas of disputed territories like Kirkuk and Sinjar. Ironically, Israel was the only outspoken supporter of, of the Kurdistan region's independence referendum. And that was definitely a milestone, and not because Israel decided to act alone and unilaterally without US or EU support, which often happens, but also there was this overt approval by the Kurdistan region leadership for uh, voicing the potential of an alliance between Israel and the Kurdistan region. 2017 was very interesting, a very interesting year for the foreign relations of the Kurdistan region of Iraq um, in references to many other state actors, but also to Israel which was, again, a shock for the central Iraqi government and had repercussions in the, in the end. What happened in 2017, in a nutshell, is Israel, from the highest level, including the president and the prime minister, voiced support for the KRG's bid for independence. With that said, uh, rumors suggested that uh, the then prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, invited even U.S. congressmen to, to Israel and tried to convince those, uh, uh, those politicians to support uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. 
Israel was the only country um, calling on the U.S. to not to refrain from uh, from standing with the Kurds and will not leave them at the mercy of Iran, Turkey, and, and Iraq. Results of this, the conclusions were for some devastating and for some like me uh, were actually, uh, that, that actually bring nothing about. Um, but before 2017, before the Kurdistan regional government even allowed uh, protesters, demonstrators to hold Israeli flags in the center of Erbil and other uh, Kurdish cities in Iraqi Kurdistan. 2014 was another milestone in these relations. In 2014, KRG's budget share from the overall Iraqi budget was cut by the central Iraqi government. And in accordance with what the current prime minister, Masrur Barzani says, it was a time when the KRG started to sell uh, its own natural resources without Baghdad's approval. That refers to, of course, oil. According to open source information that we have from, especially from, uh, from tanker tracking websites show that Israel is the number one buyer of Kurdish oil. What rumors in Israel suggested was that Israel essentially replaced all of its uh, its uh, suppliers to support Iraqi Kurdistan in a very tough economic situation. And KRG turned a blind eye on it, if not agreed to it. For 2014 and 2017 to, uh, to emerge, a historical background is also, uh, also required. And those historical backgrounds go back to 1970s and 1960s. One is uh, what constituted the relations between Israel and the Kurdistan region, and the second is what ended those relations. In the 1960s, Israel had the policy of an outreach to the region and the Kurds were the best candidate uh, for, uh, for the war against uh, the, one of the strongest militaries, if not the strongest military of the Arab League, Iraq, uh, in the mountains of northern Iraq in the 50s and especially in the 60s and early 70s, uh, it is confirmed that Israel had, uh, had outposts and stations of Mossad and the, and the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces in the mountains of Kurdistan, helping the Peshmerga to fight off uh, Iraqi offensives and to some personal memoirs by those uh, who, involved, who were involved in these operations, Israel even trained the Kurds of, uh, of capturing and holding territory, which was new to Kurdistan and the Kurdish fighters who only knew hit and run operations. But apparently uh, Israeli uh, support was uh, how to keep those territories that they captured from, uh, from Iraq. One distinct feature of all these relations were everything was facilitated through Iran. And I can't emphasize this enough because I will come to this again in, 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 my, in my speech. 1979, the Khomeini revolution in Iran changed everything drastically. That is because there was no way for Israel to reach Iraqi Kurdistan mountains anymore or Iraqi Kurds except for meetings in Berlin and Paris or in, in Washington DC. There was no possibility for Iraqi Kurdish leadership to meet Israeli uh, operatives or, or, or the leadership. And, and it also rendered the potential diplomatic, economic, and, and, and military support invalid for the Kurds. So this 1960s was one milestone that one needs to consider for how these relations were developed. And 1979 is the milestone that one needs to take into consideration to understand what is for the relations today. To, sum, to summarize the Israeli approach, one needs to look at the region through an Israeli lens. Israel is an isolated island in the region. Even with the Abraham Accords, it's, the, the situation has not changed yet. And very similar to, uh, to the Kurds, Israel has always been in the pursuit of making new allies and friends. But most importantly, for Israel's image inside and abroad, making Muslim friends bear the most importance. 
Muslim nations, big nations in the region, once they are threatened by the Israeli government, are, are to consider it actors that break the isolation of the country, which helps Israeli governments both in the national politics and abroad in international relations to, uh, to, to proclaim that the, the isolation is over and Israel is here to stay in the Middle East, unlike, uh, unlike the claims that the, that the Zionist project will someday collapse. Kurds, Turks, Iranians were all tested in this, uh, in, in this policy. Even though Israel had a policy of supporting non-Muslim entities of the, of the Middle East in, in the 40s and the 50s, it did not succeed and ironically, it was succeeded. It was it was achieved by Iran, actually, uh, the 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 main adversary of, of Israel at the moment. But Israel was successful in creating uh, strong and fruitful relations with the Turkish population, with the Iranian population, and the Kurdish population, respectively. As I said, in 1979, everything ended between Israel and Kurdistan because Iran was a different Iran now, and some 50,000 Israelis who, who were stationed in Iran were out. After 1979, from the 80s to the 90s, Turkey, the biggest Muslim nation in the region, was uh, among the allies of, of Israel um, to help fix the image of isolation, both in the country by providing Israelis the sense of security and by providing the international community of the continuity of the Zionist project in the, uh, in, in, in the Middle East and Israel as a sovereign entity. In 2010 ended the relations with Turkey as well. And even though it was, uh, even though Israel insisted a lot to, uh, to, to repair these relations, it never happened. And Kurds emerged as another actor again for breaking the isolation. Another perspective from the Israeli side is exploiting the internal conflicts of its adversaries, which cannot be ruled out because we know in relations with the Kurds, the IDF and, the, and, and, and all security apparatuses, including the intelligence units are involved. And, and, and these, these entities have a, a strategic rationale which includes the exploiting of internal conflicts of the adversaries. And one of those, one of the biggest was Iraq. Kurds being a very strong entity in, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, a guerrilla force literally cornering Iraqi forces everywhere. And they, they, they fought them in, in the mountains of Northern Iraq was one of the best tools, if not partners in the region to exploit a conflict within the Arab League and within the most, the strongest army of the, the Arab League. Although this cannot be cross-checked with other regional conflicts because we don't see Israeli involvement in regional conflicts, let's say the Baluchs in Iran or the Arabs in Iran or, uh, or, or any other entity, we can see that the, the relations coming from the 60s and the 50s and the 70s uh, were, were, the, were the fundamentals what constituted uh, an Israeli support uh, to, to, to exploit the internal conflict within, within Iraq. With that said, apart from the strategic thinking and the military approach to it, there is also lots of pressure on the Israeli government uh, from intellectual circles, from, uh, from those who are actually either former government personnel or preparing to become government personnel. They're, they're, they're forced to, under, to improve the understanding of the region. And from the Israeli perspective, I'm quoting an Israeli uh, security official once told me uh, the perspective starts with learning Arabic and, and local languages. That's why every single Israeli entity knows, the, knows these languages. And having relations with a 
group of people with, with the Kurds or any other group that is from the heart of the Middle East and the Muslim world is believed to improve the understanding of the region and very much appreciated. So Israel is always on, uh, on the look for, for relations with, uh, with potential partners and allies in the region. Uh, not only for strategic region reasons, but also for the reasons of improving the understanding of the region and how Israel approaches this region. With that said, there is also a distinct feature of Iraqi Kurds that, uh, that makes them a suitable candidate for an, an Israeli uh, alliance or partnership or support. That is the American and the European interference in, the, in their affairs. Um, tracking Israeli movements and policies in the region, one can see that Israel is seeking for, uh, seek, seeking roles in every theater where, uh, where US and Europe is involved in trying to capitalize on this interference uh, in a strategic way uh, to, uh, to, to strengthen its, its, its standing in the region. Kurds was one of them. In 1991, the Kurds were protected by a US-led coalition. In the 80s, the Kurds had the, perhaps the best diplomatic relations of any non-state actor had in, in, in the Middle East. In mid-90s, the Kurds had, again, a, a, a semi-autonomous region and very strong relations with European and, 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 and US partners. All these were factors for Israel to reconsider how it approaches the Kurds. And the conclusion was uh, Iraqi Kurds should be evaluated differently than the rest. Mainly because of the legitimacy that the Iraqi Kurdish groups had gained in the international politics and all other historical reasons I counted. Then there is the other side of the coin, the Kurds. I mean, the Kurds, the Iraqi Kurds. And how do they view the relations with Israel also set the conditions for how Israel approaches the Kurds in Iraqi Kurdistan. The main feature of, uh, let's say the fundamental of the, uh, of the Iraqi Kurdistan's, well, Kurdistan region's approach to Israel is differentiate Jewish entities from Israel. So KRG is keen on cooperating with Jewish entities and it can be seen in every single diplomatic outreach that the KRG is, uh, is, is pursuing, both in the US and in Europe. The Kurdistan region leadership has strong relations with Jewish institutions, lobbies and, uh, and any other supporting, <clears throat> supporting organizations that are either rumored or not rumored to be in connection with Israel. But KRG makes this distinction very clear. That distinction is the insurance policy of the regional government of having relations with Israel. So relations can be done in an indirect way. That's how the Israel government is doing it. The, these relations with Jewish entities, the, 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 the non-state actors also visible in 2017 when uh, the Kurdistan region went for a referendum in addition to Israeli support, of course. Kurds of Iraq have been in uh, a competition with the central Iraqi government over sovereignty. Unlike the Kurds of Turkey, Iran and Syria, Iraqi Kurdistan focuses on territorial integrity and territorial control. And the dispute is actually on who claims sovereignty on Kurdistan. So every piece of, of option for Iraqi Kurdish leadership to claim sovereignty is considered a very strong or very beneficial uh, factor. Rumors about Iraqi Kurdistan having relations with, uh, with Israel bypassing the central Iraqi government and ignoring Iraqi government's own mandates and laws, banning relations with Israel has been seen as a, uh, as a method of, of, of claiming or proclaiming 
sovereignty of the Kurdistan region government, regional government and its distinct identity. So Iraqi Kurdistan uh, successfully capitalizes on these rumors by not responding to them. Whenever there is a rumor about relations between the Kurdistan and between the Kurdistan region and Israel, the KRG decides to stay silent or just deny, or just deny the strategic facts like there is no Mossad base in Erbil, but the KRG never said anything about not having relations with Israel or not meeting any Israeli official anywhere. We know, Dr. Bayar mentioned this uh, Comprehensively, after 2017, there were negotiations between the central Iraqi government and Kurdistan. One of the main topics was the Israeli presence in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, central Iraqi government claiming that Israelis are traveling to, uh, to Erbil because KRG is not abiding by the immigration laws of the central Iraqi government. That was that serious for KRG to, to keep that uh, that that uh, that Israelis with or without Israeli passports to be present in uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. Another thing that the Kurds consider important with having some sort of relations with Jewish institutions that can be interpreted as relations with Israel, be it right or wrong, I don't know, uh, is breaking the image of weakness. That is also very visible in 2017. And, one of, and perhaps the only answer one can come up with why the KRG leadership allowed hundreds of Israeli flags to be waved in Erbil, in Akre, in Doha, in Zaho, even at demonstrations attended by President Masoud Barzani himself. At demonstrations in, 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 in Belgium, in the US, all organized by KRG uh, diplomatic missions abroad had Israeli organizations, pro-Israel organizations and Israeli flags being waved at. And uh, some claim that hundreds, if not thousands of Israeli flags were imported by, uh, by individual activists to Iraqi Kurdistan in 2017, just to, just to display them at, in, in those demonstrations. The only answer to this very complicated uh, move can be Kurdistan trying to break the image of weakness and isolation by claiming that a significant actor in the region uh, perhaps the strongest with nuclear arms is in support of Kurdistan's independence. So similar to Israel's attempts to break the, uh, the image of isolation, KRG tried to do it, which uh, did not help in the end. But one thing is clear, KRG refrains from any solid relations with Israel. There is no way to confirm that anyone from the Kurdistan region with an official capacity and an Iraqi passport visited Israel. There's no way to confirm there have been any intelligence levels, uh, le level meetings between the two entities. There's no way to confirm if there are any military relations between, the, between these two. That is because the Erbil leadership refrains from having any solid relations with Israel. In my 10 years in Israel, uh, coordinating a program that specifically focused on uh, the Kurdistan region and the Kurds, I haven't seen any solid relations either. So that is, but I also know that Israel is ready even today to, to make these relations solid. Finally, I'll go to this very short discussion of um, what is happening with these relations when they're open and they're closed, when they're over and covered. Open relations with KRG benefits Israel. We all know that. And Israel is ready to even uh, elevate these relations to a diplomatic presence um, for reasons that are specifically related to Israel and the Israeli government and its image of isolation and its strategic goals, uh, its enmity with Iran, its, uh, its desired uh, role in the Gulf and everything else, its worsening relations with Turkey, with Turkey are all these factors that are that that convince Israel, uh, in addition to pressure from intellectual circles, uh, Jews from Kurdistan in Israel, all of these con convince uh, Israel to have open relations with KRG. And 2017 was a was was a clear indicator uh, when Israel came out on 
on a, it, at various highest levels uh, announcing support for KRG and support for open relations. This is unlike Syrian or Iranian or Turkish Kurds. Um, none of these ent entities uh, are welcome to have open relations with Israel. Uh, and if they have uh, close relations like rumors for KRG, uh, that's another case. But at the same time, KRG is aware of its geographical limitations. And that is a severe one. It's a landlocked region that relies on basically Turkey and Iran, and at times on Iraq and very rarely on Syria. But there's no way out. There's no independent airspace. And even KRG one day achieves its own, uh, controlling its own airspace, its airspace will only be accessible to the airspaces of a neighboring country. There's no access to the water, to sea, basically rendering any connections to Israel. There's no shared border, but there's a shared border with Iran. There's a shared border with Turkey. KRG is very well aware of this geographical limitations, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage, and Israel falls under the disadvantage category. Relations with Israel are dependent on the approval of Turkey and the approval of Iran. Before 1979, it was all approved by Iran. Mossad agents, IDF, all Israeli operatives were based in Iran and the Iranian government allowed them to access Iraqi Kurdistan's mountains to help the Peshmerga. 2014, when Israel started to buy Kurdish oil, every single tanker departing to Israel departed from, from Turkish ports. Apparently, Turkey was approving this. There's no possible way of having strategic relations without relying on a neighboring country. And provided that Israel has the worst possible relations with Turkey and Iran at the pre at present, it is, it's even, 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 even more sophisticates the, uh, the geographical limitation that the KRG is aware of. But in the meantime, KRG is aware of Israel's diplomatic and economic outreach. And that was again proven in 2017. Israel is the gateway for Kurdistan to reach various actors, be it state or non-state, be it lobbies or economic, and in North America and in, in Europe. And, and Kurdistan tried to rely on this in 2017 as it was in a panic mode because of the upcoming uh, in assessed Iraqi operations against the Kurdish presence in, in the disputed territories and maybe in the Kurdistan region proper, plus uh, all this international pressure, KRG hoped that Israel's maybe attempts to convince the Iraqi government, uh, to uh, the US government to support uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. Never happened, uh, but who knows? I mean, who knows? Maybe something happened that we don't know. I'll sum it up this way. I, I try to think of um, a punchline of, just to summarize this, uh, this speech, I would say uh, Israel for KRG is a friend in crisis, crises, but not a friend in emergencies. It is a friend in crises when KRG is in a crisis like 2014, like in the 70s, uh, like 2014 with the budget crisis, like 2017 with the uh, political crisis with both Baghdad and, and, and Washington. Israel was a great help. Israel bought Kurdish oil. So when the US uh, imposed an embargo on Kurdish oil sales in, in conjunction with, with Baghdad, Israel was buying the Kurdish oil like to the extent of 70% of its all uh, oil imports. In 2017, KRG was in a huge dispute with the entire world, uh, united against it for its referendum. Uh, in support of the central Iraqi government, Iran and Turkey, uh, which as a very rare occasion, Israel was the only one that allowed KRG to have a diplomatic outreach, at least have some relief and at least have, at least break the image of isolation at home so the Kurds could continue to support uh, the, the, the referendum. So on, 
But emergencies are what dictates relationships in, uh, in the Middle East, what dictates alliances in the Middle East or friendship. Friends must be friends also in emergency situations. And Israel lacks this capacity to help the Kurds in case of an emergency, because there's no shared border, there is no military outreach, there is no possibility for supporting the Kurds other than with the use of, uh, use of air power, which is uh, significantly uh, tricky itself. Um, and every other type of relationship that is not violating the airspaces of the surrounding countries, that is not only military though, any trade relations can also violate the airspace because Israeli planes cannot fly over Syria and Iraq officially. Um, there's no, there's no, everything else relies on the neighboring uh, states' approvals. So it's a situation of friends in crises, but not friends in emergency. Thank you. Very exciting. Thank you very much. Now we'll go back to the panel. I will turn to the I think a little bit it was touched upon, but then a little bit nicer, please uh, go a little bit deeper. Um, and then we'll go back to Q&A before the closure. Thank you very much, then. I, I couldn't hear you very well, Mariana. Sorry. Yes, um, so we go, I will mean, we come back to you to oh. talk about Iran and the Kurdistan region. Yeah. Okay, so shall I start with Iran? Yes, so you, can, yeah, okay. you, you can reflect. Yeah. So, uh, okay, okay. So Iran, as you know, they have a very, very um, uh, long term, let's say, relationship to KRG. The current Kurdish parties, leadership, Really, they have uh, long experience with Iran, especially with the current regime. I mean, the Islamic, since the Islamic uh, uh, Republic was established in 1979, Kurdish leadership managed to develop a very, very good relationship to that uh, regime. Well, in 1980s, the Kurdish revolution movement really benefited a lot from Iran. Iran was always very, very important for Kurdistan. It was a reason for the declining of Kurdish movement in 70s, but also it was a reason for Kurdish movement to survive or at least to continue struggling against Saddam in 80s. In 19s as well, Iran played a very critical role in, uh, in Kurdistan. Their role was at some point uh, more, let's say, uh, positive than Turkish rule. Uh, Iran, you know, at the very beginning of 90s, at the very beginning of the establishment of Kurdistan government, they, they attempt to invade the Kurdish or Kurdistan's boundaries, but then their policy was somehow more peaceful towards Kurdistan region. However, still Americans were around and as you know, the Bill Clinton's administration, they have developed a strategy, a policy towards Iran, which was so-called uh, dull containment policy. Uh, so the Kurd, well, Iranians, they played a role in the, the uh, Kurdish intra-war, the, 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 the war between Kurdish parties in 90s, you know, Iran, they started really supporting PUK against KDP. And as you know, the results was, were really remarkably uh, uh, important. And, and that support uh, also invited Turkey to have more influence in the region. And the region practically administrationally was divided as a result of these two regional actors, policy towards Kurdistan, Iran and Turkey. In 1996, there were two governments and these two governments uh, were you know, running each of them a part of uh, this small tiny region until 2005. 
but uh, what I can say is that uh, the Kurdish leadership, I mean, both parties at least, they really managed to develop a very realistic and pragmatist, a pragmatistic relations to Iran. For instance, uh, Mom Jalal, when he became the president of Iraq, he managed really to bring both Americans and Iranians to negotiate and to decide on a very, very critical uh, issues related to uh, the post-Saddam's regime in Baghdad. So with that move, really, he, he was uh, able to, to make himself and even to make the Kurdistan region's position really stronger in the cooperation of uh, the presidency of Kurdistan. While Mom Jalal was trying to show himself as an ally to Iran, the president of Kurdistan uh, or the president or the leadership in Kurdistan region were trying to show themselves as they are allies to the United States. So this change of roles really uh, between the Kurdish leadership in Baghdad and Kurdish leadership in Erbil really, really helped Kurdistan government to really be more privileged. And they managed really in a very short period to start a very, very uh, effective process of constructing Kurdistan. So from 2005 until 2000, uh, let's say 12, uh, as a result of that balancing policy of the Kurdish leadership uh, towards Iran and the United States, Kurdistan was really uh, raising up and, and, and it was constructed, uh, uh, to be frank. Why Iran it was still important for Kurdistan? The role of Kurdistan was recognized and the importance of Kurdistan was recognized in 2007 when Iran decided to open their first consulate in Erbil. The first country that decided to open the consulate in Kurdistan was Iran. Not many people are maybe aware of this information. Well, it wasn't just, it wasn't because of they like the Kurds or they are really trying to grant their Kurds, but it was, it was also uh, revealing their desires of, of trying of, of because they are always more pragmatist and more realistic than the Turks, than the Americans as well. They knew the region very well. They knew the Middle East, they knew the people. They are more into the field than the theoretical uh, stuff. So they opened because one, one of the principles of Iranian policy towards Iraq is not to having a very unified and strong government in Baghdad. Having multiple, multiple decision uh, making centers in the country was important for Iran. So they opened that uh, consulate and the other countries started really Russians after them and then the other countries, uh, over 30 countries decided uh, also to open their consulate. Well, I Iranians really uh, showed more, uh, let's say, a uh, feasible role towards Kurdistan uh, via the, the struggle over the sources, struggle over uh, the decision-making, struggle over the uh, uh, management of the conflict with Baghdad. As you know, in 2012, when the Kurdish leadership decided to, uh, let's say, remove Maliki, Iranians really strongly, they interfered and they managed to uh, convince Mom Jalal to withdraw from, from the plan that was designed to remove Maliki from, the, from his position as a prime minister of uh, Iraq. So Iranians, they really, as I said, they were uh, always more uh, pragmatists and they managed uh, uh, to, to develop a policy that really keeps the Kurds at their limits. 
So Iranians, uh, because they, they also, as maybe because of their experience also with the Kurds and because of the geopolitics of Kurdistan, even historically, Iranians, they had more uh, influence on, on, on Barbanian, on, on the green zone, let's say. It's not just because of KDP was, uh, or PUK was uh, uh, more under the effect of Iranians, but even before, at uh, the period of Ottomans, that region was geopolitically always more affected by Tehran than other countries, uh, Turkey or Ottoman Ottoman uh, Empire. It was it was still very similar to 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 last uh, decades. You know, at daytime, uh, Bar Barbanians were closer to Ottomans, but at nighttime they were meeting and and and. Uh, moving with Iranians. Even the last uh, royal family uh, in, uh, in Baban, in Suleymaniyah, they uh, decided not to move to Istanbul or Europe. Half of them, they went to Tehran and the other half, they decided to go back to Baghdad. This was, uh, I, I guess, uh, 1970s. So yes, I mean, Iran, yes, they are always more pragmatists and Iranians, they managed to really uh, bring Sunnah, bring Shia, bring all uh, enemies of Kurdistan together. And they managed also to invade, let's say, Kirkuk and still occupy Kirkuk by their proxies. But Iran also was the first country who opened its borders for the first external visit by the current president of Kurdistan, Kakhni Chiban, right after the referendum, the first visit uh, of, of, of Kurdish uh, official was to Tehran, was to Iran. Well, they closed the border. Their uh, you know, reaction to, to, towards the referendum was really strong, but also uh, the first invitation to Kurdistan's leadership right after the, the referendum was uh, from Tehran. So uh, as I said, they're always more pragmatists and Kurds also, they have really no any alternative uh, to Iran. It's not just because they are very, very hostile, smart, strong uh, neighbor, but also because of Iranian influence in Baghdad, Iraqi government since 2003, they, they were never able to decide on any decision that really related to Kurdistan without the interference of Iranians. Many times Kurdish leaderships, uh, in order to negotiate with, with Iraqis or maybe finalize an important issue such as constitution or budget, they had to talk to the Iranians before in advance. And still the situation is the same. Uh, and I think in the future, Iran will have, you know, maybe even a louder voice in Baghdad. And lately, uh, Iranians, they started really, uh, let's say, uh, testing their reactions, uh, especially after this new government was formed. So Kakhne Chirban was invited to, to, to the ceremonies of, of this, you know, uh, races uh, receiving his new position with the Kurdistan flag. But also at the same time, almost twice a week, they have been threatening uh, Kurdistan's government, Erbil, directly. And even they started uh, likewise, uh, uh, Turks bombing uh, a position inside Kurdistan. And of course, I, I, I also did not mention how their proxies also started really sending drones and, and uh, uh, bombing uh, the capital of Kurdistan and, and really playing with the national security of, of uh, Kurdistan, it was also an, a clear message that, uh, well, before 2017, 
Iran were practically physically neighboring Kurdistan just from the eastern side, but now Kurdistan is sandwiched by them. You know, we have Iranians on almost on our surroundings from Erbil borders. It's not anymore just from the east side from Soleimania, but also it's from the south and uh, southwest, but and even on the borders between Rojava and southern uh, Kurdistan. Well, Iranians, when when also they wanted to deliver, when they want also to deliver a message to Americans, you can observe their activities in in Kurdistan region, and they have, you know, they have been revealing their request openly. I don't know if you are following on the Iranian media, but almost as I said, twice or more even uh, uh, per week. There are a statements related to the, the, the military bases or American bases or Israeli even offices in Erbil, especially that this Harir military base and the uh, airport or the military base next to Erbil is airport. So uh, as I said, Iran is a very, very difficult neighbor, but, but, but also an important neighbor to uh, Kurdistan and the danger of Iranians uh, is not just uh, of how they are strong, how they are effective from, how are they are effective in Baghdad or the tools that they use in their policy towards Kurdistan and elsewhere in the Middle East. But, but uh, the former president of Kurdistan, when he was asked by an American journalist to explain the policy of Iran and Turkey, he was really, he, he gave the best description of the Iranian policy. He said that, well, they are really too polite and nice, but dealing with Iranian is like eating a poisonous honey. They give you honey and then you discover later on it was a, a poison honey. So I think I will stop here. And if there is any query or question, or something that was missed, uh, we can cover it in QA session. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your, um, for your input. So actually, we have a very uh, great Lisa, and we have quite a few questions, but I think they really, they're really linked to what we discussed about. Um, first of all, um, talking about the referendum, talking about the relations uh, with, uh, with Israel, a question from the audience uh, was very much relating to what Jen tried to explain why, um, after um, the Kurdish um, referendum, Jen said that the Ukraine doesn't have this sort of support on the Israeli side. And um, another question was related more to the, to the aftermath of the 2017 and, of course, um, the focus on Iran and Turkey. So, are we talking about any sort of drama between the Turkey and Iran and Turkey? And if so, um, is it like is there such a thing as a priority in terms of uh, foreign policy uh, objectives uh, in terms of strategic orientation, either with one or the other? Obviously, both are important if there is no sort of leverage uh, in uh, between um, the two of them. So, yeah, this question for now. <laughs> Who would like to start? I'm just going to I apologize, but I was not able to hear you. Oh, uh, okay. If I think it was the case with Bayar as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about now? Can you hear me? I don't think so. I think the maybe you mute and unmute again. Uh, no, you're not muted, but uh, could you approach the? Yeah. What about now? What about now? Now, 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 now. It's very, it's fine. It's very well. Close. Fine. Okay, fine. that's great. So oh. from the beginning, yeah. All right. So um, only, only the question. Right, if you want. Only the question. Okay. okay so um, talking about Israel and the KRG, why the KRG, uh, why uh, Israel following the 2017 Kurdish referendum did not uh, sort of demonstrate a public support or continue to sort of support a public aid. And I think this is very much related to what you were talking about, Jen. Um, and then um, the other question was more related to Iran and Turkey. So following the 2017 
um, again, a referendum. Um, there is an observance of just sort of rapprochement uh, with Iran and Turkey, and uh, maybe I can answer to this one. So, is there such a thing as a priority in these two objectives? Um, and um, strategically, maybe even though both obviously these are important, um, is there such a thing as a priority okay, between the two? And I would like us to sort of um, yeah start with those, and if there is any more, I can just bring them in a second. Um, No. Uh, did I I heard Israel and I think it's addressed to me, right? Okay, so <laughs> okay, so um, can you hear me now? Kind of better, but was better before. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you try a bit uh, speaking yeah, up, maybe? Yeah. yeah. A bit closer, yes, to the microphone. <laughs> Maybe you want to type it very quickly? Yeah, I will type it very quickly. Okay. Um, all right. And we can have a chat with Bayar until you finish. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's fine. So, uh, uh, seriously, can you see me now? You're breaking up. The, the, that's the problem. Um, so, I see. I see the question, yeah. So why the public support to the KRG did not continue is a great question after the referendum. Um, first of all, the Kurds were not in a crisis mode anymore. So the second thing was that Israel was actually notified several times that Israeli support for Kurdistan could be a bad thing for the Kurds. And the initiative should come from the KRG side and not from the Israeli side. 2017 support for the referendum was initiated by Israel and was later used by the Kurdistan region government. Um, so it was not a, a requested support from the Kurdish side, uh, but the Kurdish side did not say no, that which resulted in the, uh, in the gradual uh, escalation and the uh, and, the, and, and the increase in, in Israeli support. However, things have changed in Kurdistan after 2017. The Kurds lost a significant portion of, portion of their, uh, their strategic and geopolitical importance by losing uh, Kirkuk, some other uh, disputed territories in the south, and especially Sinjar uh, on, the, on the border with Syria. Uh, the Kurds lost a lot of uh, importance because of having very bad relations with the central Iraqi government and Iraqi government sanctions on Kurdistan by banning the airspace, by closing all the border, uh, border crossings, by withholding the, the budget that led to the uh, unpaid salaries for, for over three years. All of these accumulated to uh, to reduce the the the, the international uh, perception on the strategic importance of Kurdistan, and Kurdistan was uh, and is still considered a very weak entity that can be uh, that can be easily targeted by uh, the central Iraqi government and Iran and and, and even Turkey. Um, that uh, that is one of the reasons that Israel did not have any opportunities to. Uh, to follow up with its support in 2017. Uh, and plus, I personally believe that, uh, that Israel was, uh, was privately asked to stop uh, because of the ramifications that the KRG faced after, after this. But if, it, if going back to the, the nature of the relations between Israel and Kurdistan, it is always a sophisticated uh, game for Israel and Kurdistan to play. Uh, and 2017 was a, was an extraordinary opportunity for this to 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 uh, to be played differently. 2017 was a crisis, and the referendum was a was out of a uh, out of a crisis itself. Um, was the was the very very uh, rare and extraordinary opportunity for things to 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 appear differently, things to be played and pursued differently. That was a very temporary. Uh, solution by KRG to Allah, Israel, or or not deny uh, Israel's support. 
uh, in a meeting, Fuad Hussein, the former prime minister, uh, the former uh, vice president of uh, of Iraqi Kurdistan region, uh, appreciated Israeli support for the for the referendum. I believe we were together there, Mariana, at the at the meeting in Erbil. Um, that was a very rare opportunity, a very rare case that KIG would actually say something about Israel is doing for Kurdistan. This this ended after, right after uh, the crisis in of, of, uh, in the aftermath of the referendum, after the KIG started to 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 to, to roll back what it did uh, for several years, be it right or wrong, um, uh, and it left no room for Israel to to voice support anymore. Uh, with the significant risk that uh, it could cause a black backlash, it could even cause KRG coming out against Israel under the pressure of Iran, Turkey, and the cent- especially the central Iraqi government. I agree with uh, Dr. Bayar, w- w- whatever he said about Iran uh, and Turkey, and I really like the, the part he mentioned that uh, Iran is now sandwiching some kind, somehow uh, surrounding Kurdistan from all sides. That case is going to be there and Kurds, Iraqi Kurdistan changed its strategy drastically after 2017. Until 2017, Iraqi Kurdistan was the sole entity fighting Iran in Iraq. In 2017, KRG understood that it was in vain. And there was no logic in fighting Iranian presence in Iraq without a U.S. support or uh, at least U.S. being in Baghdad and planning to stay longer. Uh, so after w- witnessing that that the U.S. left KRG alone in the fight against uh, a military, uh, literally commanded by Iranian commanders, Persian-speaking commanders, uh, had led to drastic changes in, in, in how KRG operates in Iraq, that also left no room for Israel to uh, to, to voice uh, diplomatic support for, for Iraqi Kurdistan. So in some one, okay, when Israel is likely to be asked to stop because there were ramifications for KRG to KRG lost its most of its strategic importance due to, uh, uh, to the fallbacks it had in, uh, in Northern Iraq and in the economic sphere. And three, uh, KRG changed its strategy drastically, uh, making a U-turn from combating Iran to having better relations with Iran. Thank you. Um, Dr. Bayan, and we hear you very well now. Yeah, Dr. Bayan, there is yeah. another question. On- well, I have just a very small comment. Uh, yes. Thank you thanks for this great overview. But I think, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't say Israel, but uh, Netanyahu, he really harmed uh, Kurdistan, he really harmed the whole uh, referendum is approach. All uh, President Erdogan's arguments against the referendum were relied on what Netanyahu was saying about the referendum. So that populist uh, approach really by Netanyahu towards Kurdistan's referendum was very, very harmful. Well, back to your question, Mariana. Uh, well, both of them are really important. Turkey is important for Kurdistan to, to still, let's say, preserve the semi-sovereignty that they have still, this independent economy. It's still the lifeline, unfortunately, for Kurdistan and, and its economy. Still, KRG still can man- maintain and, and, and preserve the, some and exp- express maybe or practice some sovereignty with that independent economy that relies on the exportation of oil. And Iran is important for Kurdistan also to balance the Turkish, uh, let's say, influence or maybe any uh, further invention of the territories in Kurdistan or maybe reaching out to the Sunni community in, uh, in Mosul. You know, still KRG is preventing that, let's say, or Kurds in Kurdistan, they are still preventing that. And uh, also Iran is important for Kurdistan because KRG, if KRG really want this effective role in Baghdad, KRG really needs to really have more, uh, let's say, stability 
in, in, in their relations with Baghdad, they will still need to work with both Americans and Iranians, but especially Iranians. And Iranians' role will really increase. Just today, I was reading a report uh, you know, in Baghdad's airport, there was a meeting between Saudi Saudis and and uh, uh, Iranians at the very very high ranking. They have met a couple of days ago in uh, Baghdad's airport, and it seems that even Americans are giving uh, you know what Iranians are searching for, or the Americans' allies are searching for. To, to 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 Iranians, so they have met in Baghdad, and they were they even discussed uh, constructing a direct connection or or uh, ground route that connects Mashhad to Karbala and Karbala to Mecca. And even they have discussed the situation, the last situation in Syria and Saudi. A role in, in rebuilding Syria. And as you know, a couple of days ago, uh, Baram Saleh, he managed to, to you know, initiate a dialogue between Jordan and, and Syria. So I think for KRG, both actors are really important and KRG, they, they have no way uh, you know, they have to deal with them. They have to accept them. They have to give a better understanding. And I think this could start with evaluating their experience and their relations with Iran since 2003 until uh, this moment. And the good thing is that uh, everyone, uh, almost even Turkey, they need more stability. I think everybody now is more conservative about their foreign uh, policy. Nothing is certain. And the Americans are not telling much even to their allies. You know, look at their relations with France, their relations with British, that withdrawal from the Afghanistan. So really this again helps KRG the, 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 to, to have a bigger space of maneuver and, 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 and try to regain maybe some of its losses from 2000, October 2017. So KRG has no any alternative of both these two regional important actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, Dr. Bayar, Mustafa, and Jeng Sangnik, for their insightful um, input contribution. And I'm sure this uh, is um, a very good starting point for further discussion. Um, thanks indeed for your time. Uh, and I would like to thank the audience, whoever today uh, ha has watched us. But uh, I mean, anyone can go back and then uh, just. Uh, at any time um, watch uh, through the link available in Foreign Affairs uh, Institute webpage um, today's event. I'm looking forward to for further discussion in the near future and um, thanks again uh, once more. Thank you. Goodbye everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.